we need smart regulations. We have to depend on the federal government. We're trying to write laws to protect the public. Politicians always say that. And they always pass more rules. And they create entire regulation-producing agencies. Consumer product safety. But who needs government when reputation works better? I don't make any decisions about who to hire without going to Angie's List first. You can also read reviews by real patients who have seen the doctor. Reputation. It's what allows people to do things like enjoy this delicious food. Cheers, guys. Coming to someone, a stranger's home, and then trusting them blindly with what they're going to eat. Why reputation's better than rules. That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Whenever there's a problem, politicians claim the answer is more laws, more regulation. Obamacare will make medicine better. Dodd-Frank will stop problems in banking. I mean, this is how bureaucrats and lawyers think. They believe paper and procedure will fix things. America's lawyer-in-chief sure believes that. We need smart regulations to prevent irresponsible behavior. Smart regulation. They always say that. Apparently, this, Dodd Frank, this is smart. Except after the collapse of Enron, a law called Sarbanes Oxley was supposed to stop financial fraud, but it didn't stop Bernie Madoff or the credit bubbles, mortgage scams. So we get more rules. Government is a hammer, government's force. And when you have the hammer, everything looks like a nail. But there is a better way, a private sector way to protect consumers without force, the power of reputation. I won't go to a movie anymore without checking the Rotten Tomatoes website. First, when I travel, I always look at what other tourists wrote about hotels where I might stay. I trust this much more than any certificate of approval from a Department of Business Regulation. Libertarian radio host Jason Lewis agrees. <laughs> Liberal radio host Alan Combs says no, we Those need... are great props, but, you know, look at all the trees who died for that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. going to stop financial fraud, and not just the beginning. Look, there's always going to be crooks, but if we hadn't had the collapse in 2008, maybe we wouldn't have need to have further legislation to stop financial fraud. Dodd Don yes. Frank merely codified the laws we had in place and then put them on steroids, including yeah. bailouts, telling lenders that if you redline or discriminate, the DOJ is going to sue you, but if you make loans to low-income people, then you're predatory lending. It was they, had, they had no choice, and now the government's telling them under Dodd-Frank, you keep doing exactly as we say at HUD or any place else, and if you do, we'll have an orderly liquidation. You know what that's code for in Dodd-Frank? Right. A bailout. If there was a, a lack, bailout. They if there, there was a a lack of regulation that caused the economic collapse, Republicans for years, are, and conservatives, and certainly libertarians, less government, less government, less regulation, and then the government collapsed because, and, and Dodd-Frank corrects some of it. Wait, wait. It was lack of regulation that caused the credit bubble? Uh, uh, lack of regulation that caused the economic collapse that what? had, you know, let's just how? have less regulation, less government, let's just how? not care. And people, how did it, how did it cause yeah. the collapse? Yeah. Uh, there was no a one, bubble. No one was minding the store. Alan, we've got 4,000 no, And you had crimes. these banks going and doing whatever they wanted to do and merging banks and credit unions and lending uh, institutions that could do all these different things and there was no... No, no, you know, the, the moral hazard that was the cause of this was the fact that the government came in there and said, we will insure all of these bad mortgages under Fannie and Freddie. Ex implicitly. Now it's yeah. explicit. So once you is tell somebody, don't, don't worry, go ahead and make a bad loan. Remember the Keating yeah. Five and the SNL crisis? They tend to make bad loans. Now with Dodd-Frank, this is the writ large bailout, and they're going to keep taking risk and more risk, and we're going to go Had they not the bailed out bubble. the government, where would we be now? Had they not saved the banks, had George W. Bush, a conservative, not gone in and done something to prop up the economic be underpinning off. of this country. We'd be better off? Yes. How would we Market be better off? Market discipline. How no privileges, no bailouts. If you lose money, you lose the, your own the money. The United States is the center of the economic system of the world. If those banks had collapsed, it would have affected the we entire have, how world. Many, look, how many times have we bailed out companies only to bail them out again? Was the there Chrysler are, bailout a mistake? Yes. Yes, it was. But actually, Absolutely. it saved the auto industry. What you would have is all those assets would be dispersed yeah. among profitable companies. The, they uh, wouldn't go anywhere. So you claim. All right, let's, the, let's, the, let's, the move, let's move on to another bubble, the college tuition bubble. 
Tuition costs have risen at more than double the rate of inflation for years, and I say that too was caused partly by government. They increased student loans, pushed people to go to college. But now many grads are deep in debt, can't find jobs. President Obama has a solution. I'm directing my administration to come up with a new rating system for colleges. Is that a good idea? A rating system for colleges? A government rating system. Why shouldn't the consumer know what they're getting, whether it's colleges or whether it's OSHA? <laughs> they do know. They got U.S. News and World Report, the Princeton Review. Oh, you're saying, oh, let's just go online to some website that we don't know much about or that we don't know really who's running it. Let's just see. We don't need that. We just need websites. We don't need the government, Government can right? do it better. Sometimes. The websites you deride actually have to meet a market test. If I go to a website and they say this is a great college and it turns out not to be a great college, website doesn't stay in business too long. Yeah, but you know, but if, gov if government you, makes a mistake, you, who gets fired? You don't know till you get there whether it's a great college or not. <laughs> and another way government supposedly protects us is by requiring certain workers to have a license. It started with doctors and lawyers, but government always grows. So now bureaucrats license dozens of professions, barbers, florists, yoga instructors, even interior designers and tour guides. A good, another good thing? Yes. You go to a new dentist. <laughs> yeah. Do you check his government license? No, uh, you ask friends no, for you, recommendations. You know because you're in the United States that he has a license, that he's licensed to do business. No, people still cheat. They're always so anybody can hang out, John, wait, wait, wait. So John. anybody can hang up a shingle and say, I'm a dentist without any certification or regulation whatsoever. And because That's you wouldn't you. rely on government, you would check the private listing. Is this a good dentist? Did he go to school? There would be other testing John, operations you, Alan's that would got be a point. better. Alan's got a point. There's only one thing worse than thalidomide, an unlicensed yoga instructor. Preventing someone from getting hurt is one thing, but what about all the good stuff we don't get to have because of these what barriers? What do you not have? One example. The licensing rules keep sometimes the best people out of the profession. They outlaw improvements. I'm a stutterer. Remember the movie The King's Speech? It told the true story of how the King of England finally got help for his stuttering by going to an unlicensed speech therapist. The King's licensed experts told him he'd speak better if he'd smoke a cigarette. My physicians say it relaxes the the third. Well, they're idiots. They've all been knighted. Makes it official then. At first, the king criticizes his new speech therapist. No training. No diploma. Just a great deal of nerve. Lock me in the tower. So it's just entertainment in the movie, but it's true. It was an unlicensed guy who helped him. Well, wait a minute, an unlicensed an... operation that helped me. Because of a scene in a movie, that, I'm not sure, really makes the point that we should not have any regulations so that the consumer knows when they go into a business that they are protected, that they're not going to some quack who has not been vetted in some way. Do you deny that the rules prevent some new ideas from starting? Why, why would it prevent new ideas from starting? Because it doesn't fit the government mold. Do you know why who that? likes the licensing requirements? The people who are in the business. It makes it yeah. much more difficult for competitors to come in so they can charge more and you don't have a market competition, Alan. How is that a good thing? I think having a bar to entry is a good thing. If there's no bar to entry, any quack can go and do any business they want. One last example, a softball for you. OSHA, the Occupational <laughs> Safety and Health <laughs> A softball for me. They've all been softballs, John. <laughs> uh, okay, so factories right. are dangerous. Right. We said we got to have a law and look at this chart. Right. Since OSHA was created, workplace fatalities right. have dropped all these lives have been saved all right a great so thing. need i make any more point than what that chart already meant? yes you need to because now look at this chart it shows what was going on even before osha uh-huh workplace fatalities were already dropping then where did so they dropped how much more with osha the slope of the line is the right. same. I, I, Things I think get better on their own in a free society not in every single case workers deserve to be protected if you look back into how many centuries ago or how many decades ago and we could trust every boss we could trust every manufacturer we no. could trust every place no. a worker would go no. that's why we had to develop unions in this country because we but, could not trust employers but Alan, in, the 19th century, in the 19th century you had workplace accidents kids were working on farms it was yeah. horrible why because people were trying to survive I once think. a society through capitalism gets <laughs> profitable and prosperous then all of a sudden kids can go to college people have a better workplace I think that's what's well, happening that's right. That's what's happening now with capitalism. That's what's happening now. Regulation. And no, right. because of and in addition to. Alan, thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you very much. Jason, stick around because I want to ask you about your new project. Finally, a virtual economy that allows you to join forces with people who share your values, not big governments. What are you talking about? 
I'm talking about Galt.io. This is going to be, for lack of a better description, John, sort of a Facebook plus an around me app. It's going to finally allow us to organize the way the left is organized. Because you go to us any... Us meaning, you're, call your, your, I think you're a conservative libertarian, but this is a libertarian social network. I think I'm a libertarian conservative. The bottom line is that those of us that believe in constitutional government, smaller government, have been out-organized my entire adult political life. You go to any city council meeting, any school board meeting, the left will be there. They've got an institutional liberalism in the academy, in the media, as you well know, uh, uh, public unions. We don't have that. So Galt.io is an attempt to make certain that people can go to one place, put up their cause, and then they can, they can basically form a network within a network based on market functions. And the more people you get to join your cause, the more effective you'll be, and the more Galt coins you'll get. Galt, as in John Galt? Yes. It's, it's Galt IO because... Galt.com, .org, .net, .info, they were all taken. And it's fun. It's a little shorter. It's a little different. Uh, I like the marketing yeah. angle, but yeah. It's a, it's On a Kickstarter, topic. you've had big success. You were trying to raise $250,000. You raised $600,000. Yeah, it's been remarkable. There's a real appetite for this. And your reputation and how many people support you and like you, that'll help you on this site. We're not going to tell people what causes are going to win, that's going to be a function of the marketplace. So once that cause is out there, what, what people are interested in is going to be determined at Galt.io. Well, thank you, Jason Lewis. Now, let's go on to another new website. This one's already operating. It's called Trust Cloud. I say reputation solves problems. Trust Cloud gives people more ways to determine someone's reputation. You want to borrow money from me? Want me to issue you a credit card? Why should I trust you? Are you reliable? You show up on time? You pay your bills? How will I know? I could check out your credit score, but that, that only tells me so much. So Shin Chung invented TrustCloud. And explain. So TrustCloud helps you collect all of your trustworthy data that you've generated online, on the web, on your mobile devices. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and um, puts it all into one place that you can use anywhere. So when your thumb is hovering over the buy button on the go, you don't have time to Google somebody. You certainly don't have time to get their social security number to do a background check on them. And you I don't want to give that to you. You don't want to give that to me. In the past, you were lucky enough to have uh, a referral from a friend, right? Now, your friends are hundreds of millions of people out there on the web, meaning the uh, reviews that people make of each other, the transactions that they've completed on these marketplaces can all go into Trust Cloud. You evaluate this into one score, like a credit score. Yes. We're, As you say, accountability, <laughs> efficiency, your organ, it's too much, you can't get that. Well, that's what's beautiful about, um, we, there's the idea of big data. Here's your ranking, you go from <laughs> 500 to 1,000. Yeah, yeah. 818, you're not that high. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty good. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is just somehow the computer, it drills through all this. Yeah, yeah. So what, what we have is that our, uh, we're a technology company, and we have algorithms that go through these pieces of data. We apply the, the, the different filters that don't look at the contents of your email. We look at the overall behavior and then compact it into scores. And if I want to hire somebody, I can get their trust score from iTrust in 30 seconds. A credit score, they change it once a month, takes much longer. Yes, and the big needs are trust and safety. And to have that trust score next to the buy button is really going to help us out. Well, thank you, Shin Chong. Uh, Thanks, to continue John. this conversation about reputation on Facebook or Twitter, use that hashtag reputation. Let people know, let me know what you think. Coming up, look at this luscious brunch. It's a home-cooked meal. People are having fun. You. Did you know some central planners are upset about this? Eight people sharing a meal in a stranger's home. And insiders tell us they are completely unregulated. Are you a good cook? Would you cook for more people more often if you could get your guests to cover your costs? And what about you? Are you traveling? Are you just like home cooked meals more than restaurants? Well now, both of you can have what you want. 
This is Gila Katz's home in New York City. She likes to cook for people. I really reminisce back to the days when friends would get together for a dinner party and then maybe meet some new friends. Magical things happen around the table when you sit people with food and alcohol and, you know, great conversation. So she was happy when she discovered this website, eatwith.com. It allows cooks, here they call them hosts, to connect with strangers who'd like to meet new people at a dinner party. Thanks for having us. This is so nice. Hila says her previous dinner parties led to lasting friendships. We just had the most entertaining conversations, and at the end, you know, we just couldn't stop hugging one another. Hila would have done this years ago, but she couldn't afford that. When I would host dinner parties for friends, it secretly would have been really nice if every time I threw a dinner party, I could actually, you know, cover the $200 or however much it costs. Thanks to eatwith.com, at this brunch, every guest paid $39. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Seems good to me. One more good thing made possible by the Internet and the power of reputation. And in this case, also by Guy Michelin, who founded the website Eat With. How'd you come up with this idea? Through a travel experience. I traveled to Greece, and after many tourist trap, I happened to be invited to a local family. And it was such a profound and amazing experience that when I back home, I said, okay, let's share this moment with millions around the world and just build this platform called Eat With. And with the platform, people can rate the home and the cook and say, I had a good experience. Right, so we see the trust and safety as very fundamental to what we're doing. So we created all those mechanisms such as rating, reviews. We're actually vetting all of our hosts also. We gave the host the ability to reject uh, an invi uh, uh, invitation that's coming in from a guest if they don't feel safe and, and They check and their Facebook and exactly, they queasy. Exactly. Everything is put together just so both sides would feel comfortable, safe, and that there is trust. And she charged $39, other people charge less or more? Yeah, it's a free marketplace. You can charge whatever you want. We're adding a small commission on top of that. and that's 15%, not so small. You could make a lot of money on this. Yeah, some, of the, some marketplaces actually charge 20 and 30%, so we try to be in the middle. 15. And some of the meals are 20 bucks, some are 150 bucks. Right. So we have chefs that used to work for Michelin restaurants and they give you like an eight course meal. And we have pe pe people in Barcelona that will host you for a pizza and a beer and will just give you this authentic local experience for $10. I'm often stunned by the ways my profession embarrasses itself. My first big job was at WCBS TV in New York City. They hired me to be their consumer reporter. Years later, here's part of a consumer undercover investigation from one of my successors. Eight people sharing a meal in a stranger's home. And insiders tell us they are completely unregulated. Oh my goodness, completely unregulated strangers in a home and she brings in a hidden camera? I mean, like this is a crime, but you must have faced now some bureaucratic regulation. Right. So like every company, I guess, is trying to create a new category, a new paradigm, a new culture, regulator usually leg. And now that we're coming to the U.S., we're actually working with lawyers to find the right framework for these kind of social dining experiences to happen. But I can have a social dining experience, invite people to my house. I don't have to be regulated. You must be regulated simply because somebody's making a buck? I'm not sure if we will be regulated. We're actually looking into it. So far, this industry is, is very at the beginning, so there is no regulation. But I'm sure, like any other industry in the sharing economy, and we see it a lot of here in New York, there will be challenges. And at the end of the day, I think it's a do-good business, so I'm pretty sure we'll overcome those challenges. You will, but th wait till the first time somebody gets poisoned and they'll pounce on you. I hope that's not going to happen, but we have insurance for these kind of cases. <laughs> And I should report that at that party where we taped, everyone afterwards said they were thrilled, said they want to do it again. I think Hila's is my new favorite restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I loved coming into someone's home and being part of their space, seeing the, the cooking going on while we were dining. It's a really unique experience. And of course, getting to know other people. And in fairness, I l looking at the website, Everybody is reporting great experiences. That's true. Hope you don't have the bad experience to report. Thank you, Guy. Coming up, 
I just learned that the wonderful prediction market in trade might come back. And also how technology and reputation will cure universities of a problem highlighted in the movie Ghostbusters. Personally, I like the university. They gave us money and facilities. We didn't have to produce anything. One important part of America where well, reputation seems to, so far, have little impact is K-12 through education. It's a government monopoly. Every teacher's paid the same. Their teaching reputation doesn't matter. Even if Ms. Grunchable is known for throwing kids out the window, your kids will still be stuck with her if she's their assigned teacher. And she's paid as much as every other teacher. But that's about to change, says the author of The New School, how the information age will save American education from itself. And that's Glenn Reynolds, creator of Instapundit. So why will education change? Well, it's already changing, and the reason is people have alternatives. My daughter actually went to Internet High School or online high school, and it was not homeschool. It was fully accredited. Uh, but You didn't teach her. It was no, I didn't teach her. Uh, and it went very well, and she graduated early at 16. Uh, and it let her work the way she wanted to work, which was basically to take a year's worth of course material and crunch through it in three intense weeks and then move on to the next class, which is uh, something you couldn't do at a public school. Until that happened, you didn't realize how controlled you were by the government. Oh, it's so true. You, know, you, you take it for granted, it's just part of the background, but you, you're really under the thumb of the public school in so many different ways. I mean, you move somewhere for the good schools, even if it means a long commute for you. Uh, you know, your property values go up or down based on whether you're zoned in or out of a particular school's district. If you want to go on vacation with your family, you have to wait till some school bureaucrat says you can. And if you'd rather not get up at the crack of freaking dawn to take your kid to school, too bad. That's what you got to do. So your daughter enrolls in this web school and suddenly you're freer than you were. I was amazed how much freer I felt. Now, you say this will also apply to colleges. What do you mean? Well, colleges have their own problem. Uh, you know, people have been talking for a while about a higher education bubble. And the traditional college model, actually like the K-12 model, is imported from Germany back in the 19th century. And it's looking kind of obsolete now. Uh, people spend four years, sometimes five or six years of their lives in college. Uh, and a lot of times when they graduate, uh, over 40% of the time, according to Gallup, they wind up in jobs they could have gotten without a college degree anyway. But they're in debt. I mean, you know the difference between a Starbucks barista who went to college and one who didn't go to college? debt. A hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but there's, I'm told, pushback on these online courses. I heard that the best professor was getting a hundred thousand students and based on his reputation. Mm -hmm. I thought that was great, but I read in the New York Times, uh, online courses are rethought after setbacks. University of Penn online courses, only four percent of students finished and yeah. so on. I don't think that's so bad. I mean, we'd be a lot better off if traditional education was being rethought after setbacks instead of continuing to just do the same thing year after year. But the important thing is that there's a learning curve. And with traditional education, there's not. Now the best guys might have 100,000 students and make a million dollars. Oh, absolutely. All based on reputation? And that's not so bad. I mean, that, for one thing, that gives people an incentive to be better, which uh, is pretty much lacking from the current system. There's a great scene from Ghostbusters where uh, Dan Aykroyd is explaining to Bill Murray why he's crazy to want to seek a life elsewhere. Personally, I like the university. They gave us money and facilities. We didn't have to produce anything. You've never been out of college. You don't know what it's like out there. I've worked in the private sector. They expect results. There hasn't been much change since 1800, but you say it's going to happen suddenly. The rubber band will pull and pull and pull, and then it'll break. I think that's right. I think it's starting to happen now. I mean, you're seeing enrollments falling at expensive colleges that parents and students don't think offer a lot. Uh, and you're, you're actually seeing more and more people looking into alternatives to college, especially employers like uh, certificates that show somebody's actually good at something concrete, as opposed to a diploma, which can mean almost anything. Thank you, Glenn Reynolds, and I can't wait for technology to rescue students. Coming up, the wonderful prediction market in trade. It let people bet on things like elections, on the Academy Awards, even on natural disasters, and it predicted outcomes better than pundits or polls. Our control freak government shut in trade down, but it's coming back, sort of. That's next. Trade, the company best known for its contracts on things like the presidential election, is in hot water with the feds. Oh yes, another wonderful new thing that was not to the liking of our fussy regulators. 
A year ago, American bureaucrats killed Intrade, the prediction market website where people could bet on most anything. And thanks to those bettors putting their own money where their own mouths are, people knew more about the future. Predictions on Intrade, whether about Oscar winners, elections, even the capture of Saddam Hussein, were much more accurate than predictions made by pundits and polls. Right before the last election, Bob Beckel was smart to cite the betting on intrade. They have Barack Obama at about 67 percent versus Mitt Romney at 37 percent. First of all, I think they should stop looking at the betting sites because the Gallup poll tells it all. 50, I believe it's 51 to 45, I'm not mistaken, so it gives Romney a 51 percent. Uh, no, Eric, the Gallup poll didn't tell it all. Intrade was right, as usual, but then it was banned by the new president's bureaucrats. An agency called the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, says Intrade is unlicensed and contrary to the public interest. Intrade shut down rather than try to fight the American government. Their closing was a loss to the world. But now Intrade CEO Ron Bernstein says he plans to start Intrade up again. Yes, that's right. We still think that there's a need for prediction market information to be brought to the public and we'd like to do that. Now, Intrade was based in Ireland. They escaped, but it still was shut down by American regulators because a lot of Americans bet. Yes. You're in New Jersey. How are you going to do this in New Jersey? Well, we have a new gain structure that doesn't fall within the remit of the CFTC, and therefore our new structure will allow us to accept American customers. And you're just doing a sports bet. We're going to begin with sports, but there's no reason why we can't do all types of content categories. So already there's fantasy football, there's some forms of sports betting. Well, how is yours different? Well, instead of a bet, we have a contest structure. So it's not one person against any other one person. It's a contestant competing against all other contestants in a contest. It could also extend to American Idol or Grammy Awards or the Oscars and things like that. Which Intrade used to do. Yes. Um, the CFTC says this is contrary to the public interest. We, we find that to be an amazing statement. They say it could affect election results. Well, it could affect election results, but many things can affect election results, including unrestricted spending on television ads. Here's what your former CEO said about American regulations and why he would not even visit the United States. I've been told I don't look good in an orange jumpsuit. Now, after he said that, something worse happened to him. He tried to climb Mount Everest and died. Yes, and v very tragic. Uh, completely uh, put the company into a management tailspin. And so you shut it down until now? Yes, well, the, the business relied on mostly American customers for the politics, and we would say that the presidential elections were like the Super Bowl of politics. Um, and we found that after we restricted American customers, uh, there just wasn't enough business to keep the prediction markets going. And as far as the value of prediction markets, why, why they're better, it depends on the wisdom of the crowd. Yeah. I mean, it sounds dubious, crowds, that can be more like a mob, but when you get a bunch of people together, the crowd usually knows better than any one expert. You see this on Millionaire. When a contestant's stumped, she can call an expert, usually a smart friend, or... I am going to ask this geographically oriented audience, please. <laughs> she can poll the audience. Now, the experts, they do pretty well. They get the answers right about two-thirds of the time. But the audience gets the answer right 91% of the time. Good job, audience. And this is what you want to expand. Right. Who needs Intrade back? Because there's some alternatives now. There's something called American Civics Exchange that offers a prize of $5,000 if you bet. And you can bet on things like Obama's approval numbers, where they'll be. Yes, and that's a contest. So that's okay somehow. Legally, it fits in the rules. In Ireland, hiding from the American autocrats, uh, there's something called Predictious.com. I guess Prediction.com was taken on the internet. It's pretty similar to Intrade, but doesn't yet have as much action as you guys have. Right. It's based in Ireland, and I think that's a coincidence. But one important distinction is that Predictious uses Bitcoin. And we love Bitcoin, and we love the idea of Bitcoin. But the part that we have a problem with is that we've learned from our own experience that regulatory avoidance isn't a good business model. It may work for a while, but then the government may crush you. When, when traction starts to pick up and awareness picks up, then more people obviously pay attention. Thank you.
Ron Bernstein. And as you said, uh, predictions exist because it takes in bitcoins. Uh, it's a new form of currency. More businesses take them now. A pro basketball team, Las Vegas casinos. And when we return, more good news about Bitcoin. Why accept Bitcoins? Well, why not? Cheapair.com has started accepting Bitcoins. I believe this is yours. I did something different this year for Christmas. I bought gifts for my family and TV producers without going to a store. No, I didn't give my credit card number to an online retailer like Amazon. In fact, I didn't even use dollars. This year, I bought gifts with bitcoins. What are they? Well, here's an explanation from a Wall Street Journal reporter. What's a Bitcoin? It's an invisible virtual form of currency, what one analyst calls gold for nerds. The only thing that gives Bitcoins their value is people believing they have value. Why would I believe? And I do believe I bought Bitcoins, and here's why. Like gold, no central bank controls it, so governments can't just print or mint more of the currency. Building on the gold metaphor, bitcoins are mined instead of shovels. Miners use powerful computers to solve complex math problems. When they succeed, they unearth more bitcoin. A computer algorithm limits the number. That makes them valuable. Get it? Frankly, I barely get it. And yet, I was willing to invest my own money to buy Bitcoins from this new company. It's one of several that offer Bitcoin accounts. I don't know anyone who works there. I trusted them simply because of their reputation. I trust the entrepreneurs more than I trust the politicians who have power over these things. I fear that American politicians will devalue these. And I bought my Bitcoins when each was worth about 140 of these. Now each is worth more than 700. I'm so smart. Glad I put all my money in bitcoins. Okay, I didn't really put all my money there. That would be dumb. It's good to diversify. But all currencies are based on reputation. And so far, bitcoins reputation is held up. And here to educate us about this is the creator of the bitcoin shop, Mikhail Handerhan, Handerhan, and entrepreneur Margot Avedizian. She, Dijian, she's been called the queen of Bitcoin. Why, why do they call you that? Well, some say leading woman in Bitcoin, but there aren't that many women in Bitcoin. <laughs> but what's your interest? I was living in Silicon Valley and saw, I learned about Bitcoin, and it was one of the few things I saw that could actually really disrupt and revolutionize the financial institutions and, and the way we send money. And more stores are taking them all the time. Yes, including Michael's store. And so you, you work for NASA with your partner and you decided to start a Bitcoin, like an Amazon, but where people can use Bitcoins. That's correct. We started BitcoinShop.us last April. And this is new. I trusted that the gifts would come. I didn't order them all at once. I tried a few to make sure they came first. Business is based on trust, reputation. You gotta grab people's confidence and make sure that they, they get what they ask for. And your accent suggests you're from a former Eastern European communist country, right? Great ear, John. I'm from Prague, Czech Republic. So we need more of you people because you have a healthy skepticism of government control. Correct. Was that your that's why you were interested in Bitcoin as an alternative to these things? Oh, most definitely. That's one of the biggest advantages of Bitcoin. It is a global currency that no government has a control over. It, well, it's also a settlement method. I mean, we're used to things being immediate, sending text messages and emails. Why does it take so long and so expensive to send money? It's an equivalent of text message. Now, you guys are obviously convinced that Bitcoin's here to stay, and I hope you're right, but I'm struck by how many establishment people sneer at the idea, especially when the price drops. Oh. It's all anonymous. I mean, this thing is a joke. Well, I, I, mean, I don't I, even I know totally why we're talking agree. about I'm it. I'm not I mean, a Bitcoin me, fan. Like this. A Georgetown professor wrote an article that said, I would not trust my savings to some mysterious computer algorithm created by shadowy, anonymous characters. So does he hide his money under his bed? I mean, look at banks. If you have your money in other countries, and even in this, uh, our country, during the Depression, your savings could have been taken. I mean... Bitcoin, you have, you own. There's no third party holding on to it for you. How do I know somebody won't hack into my account and take it all? How do you know people won't 
break a bank? Reputation. You're going to be keeping your Bitcoin uh, with a wallet that has a good reputation, or you could actually put it in cold storage, which means it's not connected to the internet. And these That's paper this wallets. That's you have here. Yeah. Right, show me that one. I like what you put on its cover. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be my wallet that I, you have my book title name on it. That's why yes. I liked it. So the only way someone could steal this from you, your Bitcoin, is if they physically took it from you. So that you don't have to worry about hackers in that regard. So there's like safe, there are different safe ways to keep your Bitcoin. And you, as a former commie, assume <laughs> that my government is just going to make these worthless eventually. Uh, there is a big uh, danger. Well, the Senate hearings, the government basically said they were excited about innovation. They would just want to prevent money laundering and other illegal activities. And you are, had an odd conversation with one of the regulators in the state of New York. He doesn't buy things online. So if these are the people making decisions about a virtual currency, that is a little frightening. The political regulator <laughs> never buys anything online. Thank you, Margot and Mikhail. Coming up, how I learned that reputation works much better than regulation. Sterling has come out with natural rat poison. <laughs> we need new laws. You need to re-regulate. You need to re-regulate. The government has a right to regulate. An obligation. The conceit of these people. The politicians claim more laws are the answer. But this cripples our future. Don't they see the damage the regulation causes? No, they don't. But I should cut them some slack, because if you're shallow, if you don't think very hard, it's natural to assume a law, government force, is the way to solve problems. This naive reporter thought that. Sterling has come out with natural rat poison. <laughs> Oops, that's me well, years ago when I was a crusading consumer reporter confronting con men. Calling these people up makes me think that you, that you are a crook. Well, the way you're putting this is it's true that you, that it does appear to be so. I'd chase down people I thought had ripped consumers off and try to confront them. I'm John Stossel from ABC News. We're not interested. Most wouldn't talk to me. We are not ripping people off. So then I demand government action. Consumers don't have the time or resources to investigate everything. It seems logical. As Alan Combs says, government has to rate products and services and punish bad businesses, fine them or shut them down. And so government created consumer protection agencies. I was instrumental in creating this one. Then came the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and so on. Now most every town is a Department of Consumer Affairs. But what was weird is that I soon saw, as far as protecting consumers, these government regulators made almost no difference. Years ago, con men convinced people that if you just pay a fee, you could make 500 bucks a week stuffing envelopes at home. Can you introduce me to any of those people making 500? Not within the next 20 minutes. I'll wait. <laughs> I, can show you, I can show you orders. No, I won't either. That con artist is gone, and now there are rules against what he did. But the rules don't matter. Cheaters still cheat. Make money from home scams haven't gone away. The hustlers ignore the rules or slime around them. Then some politician says, we have to close the gaps. We have to pass more rules. The patchwork system of regulations we have now has failed to prevent these abuses. And so they strangle us with more red tape and accomplish nothing. Well, not nothing. Sometimes, years into the scam, an attorney general or the postal inspectors or maybe one of the 90,000 new regulators hired by our last Republican president, both parties have been eager to regulate, one of those regulators will go after the crook. The crook then hires a lawyer, and maybe two, three years later, after a million dollars in legal costs, he'll sign a consent order. You know what that is. It's a legal document where the crook says, I do not admit to doing anything wrong, but I won't do it anymore. And often then he goes on to a new scam under a new name, maybe in another state. Once I realized that, I gathered my thoughts, which I put into this book, which argued that competition in the free market protects consumers much better than government ever will. If you were skeptical of that then, you shouldn't be today, because now we have the internet. 
Feedback on the web offers much more consumer protection than government does. So much more that companies like Lyft allow people like me to offer taxi rides to strangers. I know I can trust my passengers and they trust me because we rate each other right on our smartphones. Likewise, room renting sites like Roomarama allow strangers to rent to other strangers safely, all because of reputations we establish on the web. And the feedback keeps improving. Movie rating sites, restaurant reviews, and so on, they get better as more people participate. Even Google, all by itself, offers much more consumer protection than I provided in 20 years of consumer reporting, and more consumer protection than government will ever provide. Just Google. We need some government protection, prosecution of big scams and repeat offenders. But most government consumer protection regulation is bureaucratic and useless, even harmful because it stops entrepreneurs from trying new things. Better to leave consumer protection in the hands of millions of free people freely making choices and letting others know about their experience. I'll trust reputation over government any day. That's our show. See you next week.